a superimposer. Uh, my name is Matt Perkybile. For those of you who don't know me, I'm a part of the DCS3 cohort. And, uh, contrary to what the uh, slides up here say, this is not my defense. Uh, I did my defense a couple of weeks ago, and I'm just reusing the slides. Uh, so I'll be going through the same slides, but uh, not quite as much depth as I did in the actual defense. Uh, a little outline of what I'm going to talk about. Uh, my project's on quantum computer programming, essentially. I uh, developed a framework to support quantum computation on classical or existing computers. So, uh, kind of by necessity, uh, I'm going to do a brief introduction to quantum computing. And then I'm going to walk through a simple example of uh, factoring numbers, which is probably the most uh, famous example of how you can exploit a quantum computer. And then I'm going to talk about programming quantum computers in general, and then dive into uh, code, which is basically my uh, framework for programming quantum computers. And then I'll uh, open it up for questions. So what is a quantum computer? Uh, the computers we have nowadays are referred to as classical computers, and uh, essentially they operate on bits. The bit can be zero or one. And our computers keep getting faster and faster, but essentially all they're do, doing is toggling more light switches, essentially, faster and faster. Fundamentally, they operate the same. The quantum computer operates on qubits, or uh, quantum bits. And uh, what a qubit can be is it can be a uh, zero, one, just like a classical computer, or a uh, combination of the two. So you could have a qubit that is, say, 80% zero and 20% one. And uh, those odds are uh, realized by what they call probability amplitudes, which means you can have certain probabilities reinforce each other and others cancel out. And uh, what can quantum computers do better? Uh, factory numbers, like I said, is probably the most famous example. And that means uh, you can crack RSA, which is a pretty big deal. Um, you can simulate quantum systems, probably not too surprisingly. And you can do unsorted searches better. So uh, here's kind of a, uh, a good example of uh, how classical and quantum computation differ. On the far left, you have just your regular bit, which is essentially your 0 or 1. Um, a lot of times it comes up when you say, you know, a qubit can be, you know, 80% 0, 20% 1. People think, well, how is that different from a probabilistic bit? in the middle. And uh, really what it is, is you have these extra dimensions within a qubit. And in this sphere here, this represents a single qubit. Uh, this doesn't really scale up well beyond a single qubit, but it does do a good job of illustrating how fundamentally you have more to, uh, to play with with the qubit. And you can see how on, on this sphere, classical bit would just be the two poles, and then the probabilistic one be the uh, line through the center. So mathematically, how do you represent the state of a, uh, a qubit? Uh, you do them with complex numbers, and there's pretty much two forms that are used to express a qubit. You have the Dirac notation in the uh, center, and then matrix notation. Uh, the former was a little more compact when we started working with more qubits as a uh, this matrix will have two to the n entries for n qubits, so it starts getting pretty big. Um, as I said earlier, the probability amplitudes, so you take the absolute value of them, square it to get the probability of any particular state. So you would take that and that, you would get the probabilities, which of course add up to, uh, to one. And since they're complex numbers and you're taking the uh, absolute value squared, you could have you know, a negative amplitude up here and you could still equal to, uh, to one. And what happens with a uh, quantum computer is uh, you have what, uh, what are called the superposition of these states, the, uh, the zero and one in this simple case here. And the quantum, quantum bits, qubits, will be in those states until you observe them. Uh, when you observe them, it will collapse them down to uh, either 0 or 1. And that's all you know. You have no, uh, no knowledge of what those complex numbers are. So what happens is you kind of uh, apply these operations, and then you look at it, and you get a result. And that is a classical result. 
um, and the operations on uh, n qubits are just described by a 2n by 2n matrix that you would apply to, uh, to that. So quantum computers sound cool, you know, you can represent multiple numbers at the same time, but uh, there are several, several limitations. Um, as I was just alluding to, you can have many possible values being represented, but really you can only extract one answer. And that answer you obtain, you know, probabilistically. So one run you may get one result, another run, another result. Um, the computation has to be reversible. This has to do with uh, physics. Basically, every time you erase information, that requires energy. And uh, so if you had an AND gate, say, and the result's zero, you don't know what those inputs are, so it takes energy to erase that state. And the quantum computer has to be reversible because that input of energy basically acts as an uh, implicit measurement and then collapses you down to that one single result. And uh, the other big one is uh, it's impossible to copy qubits. Uh, you can do what's uh, called teleportation, which is essentially a cut and paste, but uh, you can't do a copy and paste. Uh, by moving it, you destroy the, uh, the source, essentially, or the state of the source, I should say. So I'll go into a practical example here of uh, how you exploit a quantum computer. Um, this example is a Shor's algorithm for factoring. Um, pretty famous example. It's exponentially faster than the, uh, the classical so solution. And the, uh, I think a key point a lot of other people in quantum uh, computer programming miss is that the quantum computer is only utilized for just a portion of the algorithm. You don't carry out the whole thing with a quantum computer. And uh, from what a lot of the, uh, the work on quantum computers looks like, that will be the case for a lot of things. The quantum computation will only be a subset of the solution to the problem. Um, factoring means you can break RSA, and essentially what it gets down to is a, is a one-way function like n equals pq. It's easy to calculate n when given p and q, but if you're given n, it's very hard to find p and q. So here's a high-level view of uh, how factoring works. Uh, Basically, we select an integer m, then we exploit a quantum computer here on step two to find uh, p, which is the period, and then we do a couple more checks and get the result. Um, key points, step two is the only part we need a uh, quantum computer for, and it's probabilistic. You may have to run it multiple times to, receive, to retrieve the, uh, the desired result. So we'll walk through this trivial example of factoring 15. Everyone knows the answer is 3 and 5. Um, this has actually been done on quantum computers in the lab. Uh, we think quantum computers commercially may be about 15 years out, but uh, that's a guess. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of the actual physical implementations of quantum computers are just maybe a handful or two of qubits on, in some physicist's lab, you know, taking up a room of equipment. So. Uh, it's like a practical technology, we're still a ways out. But uh, this example has been carried out. So uh, step one of the algorithm, we're gonna set a big N to 15, that's the number we're factoring. And then uh, N is the number of qubits we need to express to N, uh, in this case four. And then we select M equals eight, and that's just basically randomly selected.